But I want to talk to you tonight about insecurities. Insecurities. Insecurities are a ministry killer. Let me define, just for, just for a moment, what an insecurity is. An insecurity is when you lack confidence, you have self-doubt, or a feeling that you're not good enough to meet the challenge. Has anybody ever felt that way? Yeah. Amen, I have, more yeah. times than I can tell you. And you know, I want to talk to you about insecurities tonight, and, and you know, there's, there's really no way to overcome those feelings outside of understanding again, I know I said it earlier, outside of understanding that our ministry has nothing to do with our value. You're not valuable to God because of your ministry. You're valuable to God because you're a person. You're not more valuable to God, to God now that you're in the ministry than you were before you went in the ministry. That's right. That's right. Amen. He doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because of who you are. Amen. And that's good news. Amen. Amen. I burned out of the ministry in 1989 because I didn't know that. I quit the ministry. I quit. I didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Because I did not understand that my value was not based on what I did. I thought the more I did for God, the more valuable I became in His sight. And then one day I read the scripture when it says that how Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That God, for God so loved the world that He was willing to give His Son. He didn't wait and give His Son after I came to know Him. And after I began to clean my life up, you know, there's a real tragic thing in America. We try to clean people up before they ever get to know God. Yeah. That's kind of like going fishing and trying to clean the fish before you catch them. It won't work. And this week, you're going to hear some things, as Pastor Tom said, that probably is not going to be new to you. But I tell you, if you let this sink into your heart and change how you feel on the inside, you automatically start doing things different on the outside. Right. I never get tired of hearing about God's love. Yeah, right. My wife and I will celebrate our 33rd anniversary next Saturday, this coming Saturday. I'll be 33 years, and I'll still be here, but 33 years. And I never get tired of my wife telling me she loves me. Amen. I never, tell, I never say to her, well, you know, you've told me that for 32 years. I don't want to hear it anymore. No, I love to hear it. I talked to her last night. talked to her this afternoon. And she says, I love you. And every time she tells me she loves me, it does something to me. And even more so, every time I hear someone talk about how much God loves us, it does something to us. Amen. We have three Sunday morning services in our church. And my wife says, and I preach the same sermon three times. It kind of comes out different, but three times. And, and my wife said... Every time I hear it, even though it's the same message the third time, I get excited on the inside when I hear about how much God loves me. Right. And how my performance or my being in the ministry has nothing to do with that. You know, when, you, when we really get a hold of this, it really does change how we feel on the inside. And I'm telling you, in the process of ministry then, listen to this, the process of ministry gets easy or easier when we understand what we do is not who we are. What you do is not who you are. I'm not, who I am is not a pastor. That's not who I am. I'm a person. I'm a man. And you see, if we try to build in, in, all of our life around who we are, we begin to take on pressures that we were never intended to carry. And you see, the pressures of the ministry can make you forget who you are. Let me tell you something. God called you to be you. He didn't call you to be someone else. He didn't call you to be anyone but you. But you see, if we, as we become secure in who we are, we're free to be who we are. And it's only then that we'll not burn out and wear out in the ministry. I don't want to spend my life, I did. I used to try to be somebody else. 
I'd try to mimic or you know, imitate someone else. And, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life being anybody but me. Amen. God called me to be me. Now, I'm, in just a second, we're going to show a video clip. And I want to just remind you of something. We need to remind ourselves of who we are by focusing on who we belong to. Now, we're going to show a video clip. It came out of the movie. I don't know if you ever saw it. The Lion King. And it really, I think, says to us, we need to really understand who we belong to so we can understand who we are. You know, as a leader, we, we've went to great lengths to cover up our faults, our weaknesses because of our insecurities. And we've went to all of these great lengths to, to try to become something that God never intended for us to be. Again, I said it earlier, you are supposed to be the best you you can be. Amen. You can't be somebody else. You know, in the process of covering up our insecurities, you know, we, and we've covered up the person we were made to be. And that's, that's what this is about this week. It's really rediscovering our identity apart from our ministry so that we can be effective in the ministry and in, li- in the life that God has for us. I don't know about you, but I have felt like that guy a lot of times. Have you ever been in, have you ever just been in ministry and, and you wonder, where's God? I mean, where, where are you, Lord? But you know, just like, the, just like the, the, his father spoke to him and said, you have forgotten who you are. And I'm telling you, we can't forget who we are. We can't forget who we belong to. We can't forget the the finished work that Jesus paid for us at the cross 2,000 years ago. Again, that has no link to our ministry. Look what it says in your notes there in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. This is out of the Message Bible. It says, what good would it do to get everything you want and lose the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for. You know, all of us battle insecurities to some degree, and you know, I, I like most people have have uh, had a lot in my life. Somebody said, "Well, I don't really deal with any insecurities." And people who say that have so many insecurities they cannot admit they have insecurities, because we all we all deal with this stuff. You see, all of us battle this, and in the process of all this thing, you know, we forget that, that really, in order to have life, we've got to become what the Bible refers to as being whole. Yeah. In Ephesians 1 there, in your notes again, it says, verse 4, Long before, long before, He laid earth's foundation, He had us in mind, and has settled on us as the focus of His love to be made whole, which means complete, healed, delivered, made safe. To be made whole and holy by His love. You know, insecurities come from us trying to get our value from something other than God. And any time that we try to get our value from our ministry or try to get our value from people, we try to get our value from success, we will always feel like we're not capable, we're not enough. Let me tell you something. Let me get this. If you don't get anything else what I'm saying, get this. You can do what you're called to do. Amen. I like what Walker said at our conference in America year before last. He says, when you're called, you're not ready. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you something. In every step you take in ministry, you're not ready. Yeah. Right. That's the reason we have grace. Amen. We should prepare. We should study. We should do all of those things. But if we sit around waiting till we feel like we're able and we're capable, we will never do anything. Ecclesiastes says if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. So we sit around waiting until we get to this and we get it all figured out. And, and all of that does is, is reinforce the insecurities that we are already dealing with. It took me 10 years to admit, first 10 years of my ministry... It took me 10 years to admit how insecure I was. And then it took me five years to quit feeling guilty. So 15 years of the ministry, I have dealt with major insecurities. All of us still have insecurities. 
dealt with major insecurities, feeling like I was not enough, I'm not qualified, I, I don't have what it takes, I don't have enough education, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. Hey, what if we just started looking at what we do have? Instead of what we don't have. We got the Holy Ghost living inside of us. And I think He can empower us. Amen? Thank God for education. Thank God for talent. But I'm telling you, grace will take you and keep you where education and talent cannot. The Bible says some men trust in horses and some in chariots, but we're going to remember the name of the Lord our God. Because again, He's more than enough. Now I've got some things here in my notes I want to go over with you here. Uh, Some problems and insecurities create in our ministry. Number one, you attract insecure people. That's not a good thing. I remember early on in ministry, I was pastoring a church, and I was surrounded by insecure people. Can anybody identify with that? And, you know, and insecure people always find weaknesses and problems in everything everybody does. Because they feel so bad about themselves, they've got to find somebody else that's a little worse off than they are so they can feel a little bit better about who they are. Right. Anybody got anybody in your church? No, don't raise your hand on that one. <laughs> but I was surrounded by people who were insecure. And I was lis- listening to Brother Kenneth Hagin on a tape one day. Remember Dr. Hagen, Brother Hagen, I mean, what a, what a man of God. And I was listening to a tape. I'm driving to pick my daughter up at school, and he made a statement. You ever hear a statement that makes you mad? You ever hear a preacher make a statement that makes you mad? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. And he made this statement. He said, the first couple of years you pastor a church, you're dealing with the problems the last person left you. Then after that, if you've got a problem that's all the way through your church, they're getting it from you. I pulled over on the side of the road, pulled the tape out, rolled my window down and started to throw it away. Because I was surrounded by insecure people. And the reason I was surrounded by so many insecure people was because my insecurities were attracting people to me who were insecure. Remember what I said earlier? The health of our ministry depends on the health of the minister. People pick up from us things that we are without us ever communicating it. We begin to reproduce ourselves. It made me mad. But that was the beginning of a turning point in my life where I stopped blaming everybody around me. I went home that day. I went into the bathroom, looked into the mirror, and I said, I have found my problem. It's not my church. It's not my wife. It's me. I'm the problem. And with God's help, we're going to find out how to solve this problem. And that was a turning point in my life along that time when I started saying, God, I'm, now, I don't know if any of you have ever felt this way. I was in the ministry. I hated people. Anybody ever hated people? I was sick. Broke, depressed. I had all these things working against me. And I said, God, undoubtedly there's something I do not believe. Because this is not the abundant life that I'm living. I mean, this is not what Jesus said in John 10.10. He came to give me. So, my lightning fast mind said, it can't be God problem has to be me. And it was along that time of my life that I began to discover what we are teaching this week about the God-given born identity that He gave us in Jesus. And I am loved without any conditions whatsoever. And once I started changing on the inside, things started changing on the outside. I'm like Paul said, and Paul said in one scripture, you know, he says... You know, he says, I have, never, I have not arrived, but in one thing. He said, I know how to put the past behind me. That's right. He said, I'm not all I should be. I've not reached perfection. He said, but I do know how to do one thing. I know how to put the past behind me. 
And Paul understood how to put the past behind him because he knew that the blood of Jesus was the only thing that could put the past behind him. There was nothing else that could do that. And so when you start letting yourself become healthy on the inside, you start attracting different people around you. Heard somebody say this. Another statement made me mad. Heard a guy say this one time. He said, we attract who we are, not who we want. I don't like that one. It's like people going to get married. You know, they, this is the kind of mate I want. I want this kind of husband. I want this kind of wife. Well, become that kind of person and that's who you'll get. Because you will attract into your life and you will attract into your ministry not who you want, but you will attract who you are. Amen? Amen. Number two, here's another problem. Now, we're just going to point out problems. We're going to get to, get to some solutions, solutions here. Number two, people will be used and manipulated. People will begin to be, will use people to make us feel good. You know, and if you're not careful, mm, you'll start thinking as a minister, the people are here to serve you rather than you here to serve the people. Jesus was a servant leader. Remember what he did? Washed the disciples' feet. See, listen, people are not here to serve us. We're here to serve the people. They're not there for our benefit. We're here for their benefit. Fivefold ministry is given to the body of Christ for the maturing of the saints. Bring people into a place of maturity and wholeness so they then can go out and do the work of the ministry. But you see, if, if, we, if we're not secure, we start using the people around us to fulfill our purpose rather than helping them plug into the divine purpose that God has for their life. Yes. Number three, your worth is controlled by numbers. Numbers of what? Numbers of rand? Numbers of people? In other words, you know, you have a big Sunday and... And you feel real good. It's next Sunday. It's like, where did everybody go? I mean, who, who told everybody not to come today? And on that Sunday, listen to what I'm saying. If your attendance goes down and you feel bad about yourself, you've got your worth tied up in who's there rather than having it tied up in Jesus. We get so focused on, and we want people to be there for the right reasons for their purposes, not ours. I can remember that, Pastor Tom. I can remember when our attendance would go down. It's like, oh, I'm probably not even called. I'm probably not even saved, much less called to preach. Next Sunday, you got a big crowd, you know. "Ah, I feel good today. Had a big offering today. I feel good today. Goes back down the next week. You know, it's just like you're, you're just up and down. Because we we're attaching our worth To something, listen to what I'm saying, to something we can see. You can't tie your worth to what you can see. The size of your ministry doesn't determine your value. The size of your ministry does not determine your value. The size of your ministry does not determine your value. When I was preaching to four and six people and two of those were family, I was not less valuable to God than I am now. Why? Because my value has nothing to do with how many people are in my ministry. Matter of fact, I've said it already, but my value has nothing to do with the ministry. Nothing. Zippo. Nothing. Wow. Everybody say wow. wow. Number four. It's always taken personal each time someone leaves your church or stop, stops partnering with your ministry. Everything is not personal. Matter of fact, it's a good thing for some people to leave your church. 
There's people who have left our church. I would pay them a thousand U.S. to not come back. Let them go be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. Amen. Some people, Pastor Andrew, you just don't need them. I mean, they become a thorn to you. Don't take it personal when they leave. They're leaving for their reasons, not yours. You know, it's never a matter of who, it's never a matter of are people going to leave. It's who is leaving. That's the question. People are always going to leave your church. A fellow told me a while back, he said, well, I said, how's it going? He said, well, somebody left my church this week. I said, only one? You had a good week. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, and I, I tell you, we, we, we take it personal. Why? Because we've got our worth tied up in. Jesus couldn't please everybody. I mean, He couldn't please everybody. So why do we think we can? We can't. We can't please everybody. We can't even please ourselves. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes I make myself unhappy. Sometimes I want to leave my church. I got a note in your, in your notes there. I think it says, we need to make it easy for people, making it easy for people to leave prevents a church split. We say this, said it for years. We want to be the easiest church in town to leave. We don't want people to have to get mad to leave. If they don't leave, let them leave. You know what we found by making it easy for them to leave? We, don't, we, we, don't, we have not had a church split. We won't have a church split. And they come back. Not all of them, thank God. But some of them come back. Why? Because we made it easy to leave. It's okay. Everybody say, that's okay. Listen, some of you came in here today, you that are pastors. Some of you came in here today, because I know because I know how we are as pastors. Some of you came in here today and you're really upset because somebody left your church. You took it personal. And sometimes, you know, we do make mistakes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We don't always make the right decisions. So, and when we make wrong decisions, we need to make it right, do the right things about those things, and that goes without saying. But I'm talking about some of you, take, you took it personal over the last little while because somebody left your church. And I can tell you this, often the people that scream the loudest that they're with you, the first ones run off. I'll be with you. That's right. What Peter said. Jesus said, we'll find out. We can't take it personal. Number five. If you have insecurities, you will not have a clear vision. Therefore, you will not know what to say yes and no to. This is what I'm saying. Pastors, specifically pastors. The vision of your ministry is not determined by a committee. Amen. Matter of fact, there is no such thing as a Bible as a committee. That went over really good. But the vision has to come out of your heart. It has to be what you live, eat, and breathe. And you know, when you look at it in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there's no revelation, people cast off restraints. See, if you don't have a strong, clear vision, you don't know what to say yes to, you don't know what to say no to, because you don't know why you're here. Hey, we got to have a bigger vision than having church this week. Yeah. As some people in the States, what's your vision? Have church Sunday? <laughs> wow. And most people have a vision of trying... They're more concerned about... Their vision is more about keeping the people they already have than reaching people that don't know God. And we start catering to the chosen frozen. And we'd rather, we'd rather keep them happy than reach those people that are hard to deal with. I'm telling you. Don't want to upset anybody. 
by getting those people in the church to have problems. Here's a thought. We all have problems. We're all dealing with stuff. We're all messed up to some degree. I'm not. Yeah, you are. You just, you just messed up. You don't know it. But we're all messed up. Got to make it really clear. Heard this said one time, many things catch our eye, catch our eye, but only a few things, our heart, pursue those. Once a year, you ought to teach you. If you're a pastor, you ought to, you ought to do some teaching on who you are as a church. We told our people back in the first of the year, we do this, you know, we did it this year. I said, I'm going to talk today about who we are as a church. And when I get through, when I'm finished with the sermon today, some of you may want to look for another church. And if you want to, you tell us what we're looking for and we'll try to help you find it. But this is who we are. Andrew's, Andrew's part of our church. I mean, we, and we talked about who we are. And this, this, come, this came out of my mind and my wife's heart. You know, I'll just read a couple of few things that we talked about. I said, you know, understand this. We are a church for messed up people. I said, in other words, you're going to come here and you're going to see people that here sitting beside you that you may see their photograph in the paper next week they've been arrested. We are a church for messed up people. Messed up people are welcome in our church. If you're looking for a church where messed up people are not, or where people hide the fact that they're messed up. Keep looking, this is not it. And I said, we teach a positive, non-condemning message, and this is not going to change. We care about more about what works than our traditions. Here's a good one. I said, we're not a church for unhappy Christians. Now, I'm not talking about, you You know, you can't be going through, so I'm talking about, you know, those type of people that always find fault in everything. It's like they didn't like where they were going to church and they came to your church and tried to make you like the church they just left. We're not at you. I say, if you're an unhappy person that's that way, you're not going to make it here. We're, you're not, you won't make it. We're a church with a world vision. We're not a perfect church. I'm not a perfect pastor. I told our people this, Steve. I said, if you come to church here long enough, I will offend you. I will disappoint you. You just, just hang around long enough, I will. Why? Because I'm a human. Understand. There, there's a lady left our church five or six times. <laughs> Kid you not. And she said, here's why I left. I can't stand the fact that my pastor's not perfect. Said, you talk too much about your weaknesses. And I said, if you're looking for a perfect pastor, I'm not it. I'm not it. I'm a human being. There's only one perfect. Jesus. I will make mistakes. I will offend you. You know what's amazing about, I'll just throw this in. Isn't it amazing how people will get offended and leave church? If I had got a divorce every time I got offended at my wife, or she got offended at me. Mm-hmm. No, when you're in a family relationship, you work it out. That's right. Come on now. You work it out. Right. But if you're insecure, you can't work it out. Right. You got to run. Right. You got to hide. Mm-hmm. Cause trouble on the way out. Those are those people you pay not to come back. Anybody had any people leave your church that way? Like, thank you, Jesus. My prayers have been answered. Number six, you'll spend your life trying to live up to the expectations of others. You know, I 
can remember living that way. You, you try to live up to everybody's expectations. So this person, you know, they, they, you know, particularly with pastors, you know, the Bible says there's different offices but different ways to administrate it. And so I tried to be what everybody thought the pastor should be. Don't worry, yeah. And on top of that, I was so insecure that I wouldn't empower the people to do ministry. And so I was so insecure, and out of that, that insecurity, I tried to live up to the expectations of, of, of the people, and in the process, I lost who I was. Well, so I'm trying to be like everybody else wants me to be, rather than to what God called me to be. Look at the next one. No one can disagree with you. <laughs> Get a laugh. Why? Because you take it personal. You know, one of the things I have found in, by, by ministry experience and life experience... Not everyone who disagrees with you is against you. That's right. Not everybody who disagrees with you is against you. You know what? If somebody disagrees, it doesn't mean something's wrong with the relationship. Amen. But see, if you're insecure, you've got to have everybody to agree with you. So you surround yourself with a lot of insecure people. That a little more insecure than you are, and because you the you the you the, uh, the the man or the woman, they want your approval, so they're gonna do everything they can to keep you happy. But everybody who disagrees with you is it's not a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But it will be a bad thing to you if if you are insecure. Number eight, pride. Pri, excuse me. Praise makes you prideful. Listen to this. Insecurity. When, you, when you're insecure and somebody praises you and honors you and pats you on the back and, you know, high five and all those things, when they do that, it's easy to start believing them. It's easy to start believing you're that good. Yes. Don't believe everything the fans tell you. Because next week you may strike out. Number nine, criticism discourages you. In leadership, you will be discouraged. You'll have some, you'll have some, or you will be criticized. Don't let it, don't let it discourage you. Don't believe the critics. There's a scripture in John where Jesus said, your approval and disapproval does not mean anything to me. He was secure. Think about this. Jesus being baptized. Father speaks from heaven. Holy Spirit comes down in shape form of a dove. Father speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Before I ever preached a sermon. Right. Before I ever raised the dead. Yeah. Right. Before I ever healed a sick person. Right. And Jesus operated out of, My Father's pleased with me. Not because of what I've done, because he had done nothing. That's right. He, he went into the ministry knowing the Father was pleased with him and couldn't be any more pleased with him. And he operated out of that security of what the Father thought about him. So therefore, other people couldn't pull his chains. They couldn't throw him off course by criticism. Three different times at our church, other churches, believers, put tracks, <laughs> gospel tracks on our cars in our parking lot while we're having church. <laughs> tracks telling us how to get saved. Does that bother you? I can't tell you how much it don't bother me. I could care less what the church thinks. 
One of them, and they had their name on it. Their church name on it. We're not trying to reach the church. I don't care if the church criticizes me. Pharisees criticize Jesus. And have you ever noticed the people in the cheap seats always scream the loudest? But if you're secure, that criticism won't get to you. Let's see. Please, God, out of the, you know, operate the ministry, do the ministry that He wants me to do, or keep everybody happy. Hmm. Boy, that's a hard question to answer. You know what? That really is a hard question to answer if you're insecure. You'll be criticized from time to time. Can anybody say amen? Amen. <laughs> You'll face critics, but don't focus on them because the only opinion that matters is God's. And then number 10, confrontation is avoided at all cost. As a leader, leader, there'll always be things you have to confront. Avoiding confrontation does not make problems go away. Now here's the way I used to be. I didn't confront anything. Then I went nuts. It's like, there's a problem? Boom! We'll deal with it yesterday. But I'm kind of finally getting to that place where I don't necessarily think I have to do it today. You know, I'm a bottom line person. My wife is not. Right. Just tell me. I don't care about the birth pain. Show me the baby. <laughs> but I'm, I'm learning as I've, as I've gotten older. There's a balance there of not feeling got to confront everything today. But also where you don't put everything off and never deal with it. This is what I'm saying. Is in the ministry, this, this, there's a verse of Scripture in the book of Acts that... I mean, it just blew my mind years ago. It says, take heed to the flock which the Holy Ghost made you the overseer that, he, that God purchased with His own blood. Yeah. So that means that's a pretty big responsibility, but thank God for grace. Yeah. So that means you and I have been entrusted with people, and part of that process is helping people deal with things and and, and, and confront the issues in life, but you're insecure, you can't do that. Well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Oh, okay. So you let Sister Bucketmouth run 25 people that don't even know God out of the church because you don't keep her happy. Come on now. Because right. we'd rather keep her happy or him happy than reach those people. It's going to get better. Look in your notes there. God uses us even with our insecurities and other issues. It's like I said, Pastor Walker said at our conference in America a couple years ago, when you're called, you're not ready. The truth is, you'll never be ready. You understand that? Forget it. You'll never be ready. You know, I think about it sometimes, guys, ladies, do you feel this way? I'm so far over my head in what God has me doing. It's like, it's, it's got God, you've got to do it or we're sunk. That's a good place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Because I never have gotten myself in trouble when I didn't know. It's when I thought I knew. Because when you don't know, you have no option other than trusting God. That's right. How, can you, how many of you can remember the first few times you preached? Man, you just walking the floor praying. I remember walking the floor at 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to preach at 10 o'clock. God, I'm preaching at 10 o'clock. 
Help me. Jesus, help me. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Lord, if you do, God, do you know what time it is? You know, I didn't, no one had ever taught me how to put a sermon together. You know, how to prepare. So it's like, I'm in trouble. And so I'd be walking the floor at 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, Sunday morning. God, please help me. Jesus, help me. Help me! I'd say, you're going to be real embarrassed. You don't come through, I'm telling them. You know what? He always came through. But see, when I got myself in trouble, I have to learn how to prepare. Because I know how. I know how to put a sermon together. I know how. See, the problem is, is when, not when we've got all these problems. Because when you're in over your head, you know it's got to be grace, it's got to be God, or we're sunk. That's right. I mean, we're majorly sunk. So we know it's got to be God. But when you think you know how. Well, I can do this. I've done it thousands of times. Mm-hmm. Thank God for grace. Insecurities in God-called leaders are not uncommon. And by grace, we can overcome them and have a healthy, healthy lives and ministries. 70% of people in ministry say that their self-worth, in other words, what, how they feel about themselves, is lower than it was when they first went to ministry. Most it shouldn't be. In Acts 4.13 it says, And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, and they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Well, Pastor, I don't have enough education. You know what that word ignorant means? It means unskilled. It's it's the word, it's the same word that we get our word idiot from. (laughs) They perceived that they were unlearned and idiots. But they marveled They marveled at them. They were amazed and they marveled. They realized that they had been with Jesus. I wonder what would happen in our ministry, in our church, or the platform that we speak from, is is if we threw aside our abilities, became secure in Jesus, and we walked on that platform next week, and they said, that's not an idiot this time. He or she has been with Jesus. And they're marvel. Says, what happened to you? You're a different person. It's not me, but it's Christ that's in me. Christ in me. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Thank God. The Bible says He's chosen the weak things of the world. Isn't that, isn't that wild? It's amazing. I mean, when God called me, I thought, you have got to be kidding. I had never gotten up in front of a class and gave a, gave a speech in school. I had a, a, a reading level of, of grade three. My reading, I mean, I was pitiful. I said, okay, Lord, it's got to be you. Let's don't ever lose that, Lord, it's got to be you. It's got to be you, Lord. If we're going to touch, we don't have the power to touch lives. Thank God He does, though. Yes. This is what it says in the Living Bible there, that verse. It says, And when the council saw the boldness of Peter and John, and could see that they were obviously uneducated and, non- uneducated and non-professionals, they were amazed and realized what being with Jesus had done for them. Wow. Having been with Jesus... Made ordinary men extraordinary. Let me tell you something tonight. Jesus can fix it. He can fix the pains of our heart. He can fix our insecurities. Hey, 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 get this. 
He knew what He was getting when He got you. And He's not disappointed now. He's got confidence in us. He believes in us. Jesus can make us whole and, and, and out of that we need to feel the love of God. And, or as we feel the love of God, we will be made whole. You may be here tonight and you feel like that you're a wounded leader. Maybe you wounded yourself. Bad choices. I've done that. Or maybe you've been wounded by somebody else. And you're afraid to believe again. Afraid to get your hopes up. Because you're wounded. You're hurt. Proverbs says that hope deferred. Hope that doesn't happen makes the heart sick. And you just end up going through the motions. Because we know how to do ministry. Mm -hmm. Not life in it, but we know how to do it. Proverbs 12, 6 says that the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. But he didn't stop there. He said, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Yes. Words of the wicked. We think of wicked, we think ungodly. But really it's talking about condemned. Feeling unworthy. See, the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. In other words, you wounded yourself, somebody else wounded you. And when they wounded you, when it says they lie in wait, that's like an ambush. And an ambush is, it kind of sneaks in from a place that you didn't see it coming. Yeah. And about the time you're going to have that breakthrough in your life or your ministry, that stuff springs up from the inside. And it robs you. I can't ever be successful. I can't have good relationships. I can't have a good marriage. I can't have a ministry that touches lives because we wounded ourselves or somebody else wounded us. Well, I'm telling you today and throughout this week, you're in a safe place to deal with those things. Amen? Let's bow our heads together. Holy Spirit, You know our hearts. You know every person in here. You know every situation. Jesus, I so thank you that Luke 4 says you came to heal the brokenhearted. Lord, and I know I could make this statement in any gathering, but Lord, I really felt prompted by you as I meditated on it this afternoon and just listening to my heart and what you want to do tonight. There are people in this room today, church leaders, ministers, pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, church workers, that have been so wounded, they don't want to even try anymore. They're hurt, they're disappointed. Let me tell you something this evening, I've been there. I've been there. I have been there where I thought, I don't know if I want to do this anymore or not. Just a few minutes and I can't get away from doing what I feel like the Holy Spirit's going to have me to do here. In just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you that if you're hurt tonight and you're wounded, again, you're in a safe place and it's okay. We've all been hurt. But you're here tonight and you say, Alan, I have been wounded. I have been hurt. And I need somebody to, I need, I need prayer tonight. You know, I can't fix it. These other ministers that are part of the team and speakers this week, we can't fix it. But I'm telling you, Jesus can. He can start a healing process in your heart tonight that'll change everything in your life. So, what we're asking you to do tonight is if you're wounded, you're tired, and you're saying, you're saying, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Maybe it was something you did. Maybe it's something someone else did. It makes no difference what it is. 
but you're discouraged this evening. I want to ask you to very quickly, as we stand together, I want to ask you to step out and come down here. We want, I want to pray with you tonight. I want our, us as a team to pray with you.